Thank you. <laughs> so yes, so we are. Good, great ideas. I I want them. I want to do all of this stuff, and I, I can't yeah. remember them all. I need to um, now, if you want to remember them all, then uh, we will re repeat those. Okay. So um, the events that bring members in are like open houses, uh, game nights. Um, let's see, the, the speech crafts, and uh, we there are several different versions of speech craft out there. It, you just find the one that seems to work with you the best. Uh, then you can do things like the murder mystery, which kind of keeps the uh, spark in your club and keeps them wanting to come back and see what's going to happen next. Um, we had uh, inter-club co competitions in table topics, uh, and we had an inter-division um, competition on uh, improv, which was really something else. And we got a chance to network with the other members of the clubs and you say oh i didn't know you were a member of that club oh i didn't know you were a member of that club oh that's you know and because of the the networking that you get done there you feel more familiar with a group that's bigger than your own club and you realize there's more stuff out there than just my own little club this encourages people to step outside their club and look at other clubs and what's nice about that is that they can bring ideas that work in that club back home and play with them yeah you know it'll work or it won't work it doesn't matter whether it works or doesn't work because it's a new experience and if it works great if it doesn't work we learn something so that's one of those uh, things that you want to do so um, then you also have to make sure that your secretary, oh, I'll tell you what, that secretary is going to get the uh, work cut out for them. They have to keep track on what happened and what the results of these events were. Let's see, we had, oh, we had um, one club, uh, uh, Greater Communicators, that had a seminar for the uh, general public on interviewing skills because it was at a point where people were worried about getting jobs because of COVID and all of that. So and then we take a look at um, reviewing what services we as a club provide our members. Remember those avatars that we did? Have we come up with solutions to fit their needs? Are there sessions we can initiate that will address their specific problems, the reason that they got into Toastmasters in the first place? Are there uh, classes or seminars that the district can provide? So for instance, if you have somebody that is a brand new VPE, is there some way that they can learn how to use free Toast Toast or uh, Team or Zoom to make sure that all the agendas come out and are easily figured out it's one of those things that we have to take a look how good are we at solving people's problems because if we want to bring more people in we have to solve a problem that they have so you might have people who are complete technophobes they hate anything technologically and you know get them on a zoom no not the zoom that's too hard and then we have to make it easier for them and uh, let's see one of our competition speeches last year um carol was talking about how she had no idea how to work the technology and whenever she wanted to send an email or anything more complicated than that she had to get tech support to come in and then she came into the toastmasters and they decided that they were going to uh help her out with zoom because uh we so we initiated some zoom programs on how how zoom worked and then covid hit 
spoke like that. And, she, and they said, oh, what are we going to do? She says, well, we can meet on Zoom. And they said, Zoom, what's that? And then she became the Zoom master for her whole company. And they're thinking, how, but she, how? <laughs> it was wonderful to see the look on her face when she says, oh yeah, I am now the technological marvel of my <laughs> company. And she's not a spring chicken. Um, so uh, then we took a look at uh, having weekend programs on how to work the pathways and going through how do you make sure that all of your stuff is taken care of. And one lady has 10,000 spreadsheets that she can show how to get from point A to point B and get your uh, DTM out of that. So that was good. Um, the most important one that is least used is breaking out the club success plan. You remember when we did that at the beginning of the year? It's like, oh yeah, we're going to fill out these 22 pages. <laughs> or now see, yeah, there you go. Um, we have a one page uh, club success plan that most of the clubs use here. And then they um, copy that onto the 22 page thing because a lot of it is so redundant. Anyway, so we look at the uh, one page or the 22 page or the five page, I don't know what form you use, and find out what was our club's goals when we sat down and said, this will make our club successful. And in looking at that type of information, we had to discuss uh, how many DCP points we wanted, how many more people we wanted, how were we going to uh, set up our events like what we just talked about, how were we going to keep the spark going in our own club, how were we going to uh, recruit people, what kind of market were we going to get into, what was the main uh, niche of our particular club. If you look at all the stuff that's in your club success plan, it always says until June 30. There weren't any goals that were set for December 30, where most people don't. And so now you have six months to do what you were planning to do in 12 months. <laughs> How far are you along on your plan? is um is this plan useful for indicating what the executive committee had considered goals for the end of june is it okay because if it isn't then you need to take a second look at it and say okay well this is what we've managed to do in the past six months what would we need to do in the next six months to make it work and that way we can uh keep on track we don't go off bunny trails and down the hole and then suddenly the month before the end of the year and and we've gotten into contests and finished out our uh conferences and then looking at the awards that our club will make and we're going oh i forgot i was going to submit a level three and you know when were you going to do that september <laughs> <laughs> See, so uh, take a look at where your club is now. And then also, I don't know if anybody is doing this or not, but do you have a specific person that is in charge of your success plan that they keep it up to date and find out where things are? Um, a VPE, maybe uh, the secretary, the president, whatever. How do they keep track of progress? A lot of times we are worried about our individual progress and everything, and we don't pay attention to the other members in the club. Well, as long as I get my uh, awards, ed educational awards taken care of, everything's going to be fine. 
Well, yeah, but you may have a brand new person that does not know how the system works really well and needs some guidance. Um, do we have all of our paperwork in, our administrative type of stuff in? Oh, yeah, gosh, we've got to get those dues in. And, oh, are we doing Venmo yet? <laughs> and so, yeah, I am secretary of one club, and I haven't quite figured out Venmo, and I will, but I promise, really, Scout's Honor. Um, we had one club that had a great big poster board with everybody's name on it. And they would put stars on the accomplishments and they would have like a race across the board, you know, who's going to get this project done and who's going to get that project done. And, and, oh, I'll bet, I'll bet, uh, John will get, uh, his, uh, first level done before, uh, Julie will, you know, and, and, or, um, how soon do you think you could do that next speech? Uh, because, uh, Mary still wants to know how how you get evaluated on evaluating. And if you could demonstrate, that would help. Um, we once tricked a guy into uh, giving his, uh, oh, what was that? that? Was that his second speech or his first speech? Um, with John Pogge. And we tricked him by uh, saying, hey, John, can you help me out on, on my presentation? Yeah, I have to interview somebody. So I interviewed him and asked him about where he came from and what his family was like and everything like that. And at the end, then our uh, vice president of education came up and pinned a Toastmasters pin on him and said, congratulations, you just did your icebreaker. <laughs> so it was, it was sneaky and he was surprised. And I said, see, it wasn't nearly as hard as you thought it was going to be. And he said, no, it wasn't. It was just, just talking. It was, a, so it doesn't have to be perfect. And I says, it can't be perfect. How do you learn anything if you do it perfectly the first time? Um, um, when, uh, you do have a progress poster that lets people see their goals and their progress that gives them a visual as to how far along they are and uh one club that we were in we would have that posted up uh first thing after the um saying the um uh, club mission statement they would put that up and he says oh we got another one yay we got another award Woo and um this was uh put up by the vpm and so they were congratulating people on uh, their progress and everything. And people, some people, I'm going to qualify that. Some people really like the recognition that they've gotten somewhere they, that they are progressing. Some people are embarrassed about uh, recognition. Some people um want a prize or something okay the first person to get a, a triple crown gets um some uh toastmaster bucks or gets gets this ribbon or um uh, a uh, certificate of some sort you know it doesn't have to be a certified certificate from toastmasters it can be cert certificate that you can buy at walmart and get a frame for it and then write something in there you know uh fastest accomplishment or or uh uh most number of awards in in a six month period or something of the sort that that uh gives them a prize or or uh, get a give them a ribbon or something of the sort that they can hang up in their cubicle and they say what'd you get the ribbon for oh ha, hi just the most brilliant person in the club <laughs> okay all right, so then check with your mentors. How are your mentors working with your new members? Are they making the type of progress that will encourage them to stay with the group? We can't have them sitting there going, well, I know I joined this group for a reason. I just don't remember what it was. Um, and so we have to keep their goals in front of them because they're not used to doing this. Most of the time, in a corporate setting, 
they're going to tell you what your goals are and most of the time in a private setting you set your goals and March 17th comes along and all the goals go right out the window uh, so this is accountability that allows people to move on and keep their goals in front of them because unless somebody is telling them what their goals are they've never had to reach a specific point in their career or in their personal lives or whatever um got runners who say well i want to run a marathon when well in the fall what year um <laughs> or uh they will say okay i'm going to be running a marathon for the november 5th blah 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 and so they have it all planned out and everything is going to be fine and they get their registration and now they're tied to this goal and they can't get out um we've also seen that in uh one of our members is an avid bike rider and she goes into um bike ride across nebraska or bike ride across um iowa rag bright thing um and there are other type community rides it's not a race as such it is a group of riders that are going a certain distance through a certain part of the country that they are i guess the the main goal is to interact with other writers but you have to train for this because otherwise about one quarter of the way through the first day you're saying why did i do this <laughs> i'm going home now <laughs> where's the bed game and so they have chosen a goal that they don't even know they can reach and that's especially true in Toastmasters because they do not understand the progression of how the stuff that we teach them in Toastmasters helps them everywhere else. They do not understand how the uh, table topics helps them to think on their feet when somebody asks them a, a tough question. Um, they're not sure how to go about doing a longer project where they are the lead because they've always been the follower, you know, whatever the boss says, whatever the boss says. And then they say, okay, you're the boss. I'm the, I'm the one. <laughs> and they will just, well, like Carol did. She says, yes, I am now the, the guru for Zoom. Somebody needed to do it. And she had all sorts of leadership background. And she'd been a division leader, I think, wasn't she also a, a district governor? No, she was a division and area governors and yeah. later became division director. Yeah. But she's she is a, some level of administrator in a community college as well. Right. So, although she didn't know much about Zoom, she had a lot of experience in leadership. She does have her DTM, and she was Toastmaster a year, one year. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. So. Beat me. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. See? All right. So uh, you have mentors that work with uh, newer members, uh, more inexperienced members. But do you have mentors for those people who are experienced already? Are they just out on a hook? Well, let's see. What would a, an experienced member need a mentor for? Any ideas? Yeah, Vicki. It's interesting. I'm just writing or preparing my reflect on your path, and I'm talking about exactly this. And some of the the suggestions that I've made uh, for the more experienced members are, are just little things. It doesn't need to be something huge. It might be just something very small that they want to tweak. 
And the beauty of an online forum is that you can attend meetings, you can attend functions all over the world and find someone that really resonates with you and then you can approach them and ask them if they will help you with just that that little thing. That's good. That's good. Elizabeth. Well, the one part that happens is arrogance. And I have found these people with multiple DTMs and stuff. And then I'm looking at their speeches and it's, when did they last get any honest feedback? And um, they need a mentor just as much as somebody that will really sit them down and say, this could still be improved. Yes. Um, one of the things that we did that was absolutely positively sneaky is we have a uh, competitive speakers group. And I, it just forms every year. It's not an actual club. It's just a, kind of a seminar that we hold. And so the competitive speakers, the ones that want to go uh, for the uh, international speech will come to this Wednesday night meeting and learn how to turn their speeches into the kinds of speeches that will win contests. And we managed to get two people in the past two years um, up through regionals. And this, we hadn't had anybody that got through regionals until uh, and since 1954. And suddenly we got two in two years that, that got up that far. Um, but uh, one of the things that they did is they had these experienced speakers have to go through the ringer and say, okay, now this is an experienced speaker and you're not gonna get any feedback from us. What we are going to do is we're going to judge how well you did it. And because judging is different than evaluating, <laughs> right? And so they get up and they would do that and then the people who had been in the group would just rip them apart. <laughs> and they said, wow, really? Wow. <laughs> and uh, the it made some of the members who were much uh, younger than these professional speakers who, well, they weren't even professional speakers because they weren't getting paid, but they were, you know, the the royalty of the group, um, they were less anxious about doing evaluations on these same speakers after they'd gone to competitive speakers and saw all of this stuff, everybody can improve, right? And you go, everybody, even the DTMs, yes. <laughs> and then uh, sometimes we have the experienced speakers that are, they're really good at speaking and then you ask them to step up and do some leadership and that is sometimes a big step <laughs> he's shaking his head because he's a he's a was a district director last year so but um that uh sometimes takes a mentor to show them the ropes when it comes to leadership yes amy that's what I was going to say in answer to your question of something about maybe they have taken on or are thinking about taking on, taking on a leadership uh, role that they haven't had before or that they haven't had in a while. That would be a really good reason for a more experienced member to have or need a mentor. Exactly, exactly. So uh, when when you're working with more experienced people sometimes you uh, put them into a position they have never been in yes of course you've got your dtm yes of course you've you've uh, participated in every speech contest and and this would you like to run the contest this year oh <laughs> yeah well and it's it's something that keeps them motivated and they do learn something new 
Uh, if you have an experienced speaker who has not progressed very well, and we've had to deal with a couple of those, and they start, you know, well, I've been speaking for 25 years, and they have been speaking for 25 years, and then um, they aren't much better than when they started, but they think that since they've been speaking for 25 years and have gone through all the projects that uh, they shouldn't be getting any type of harsh or um, accurate <laughs> evaluation. So we make them uh, go through the evaluation training for other people. And so they realize what they are trying to teach other people is what should probably be applied to themselves have you ever had to deal with somebody who uh, needed a mentor and uh did you volunteer to be the mentor or did you recommend somebody i guess both I am now, I've got at least four protégés now. I finished the mentoring program and I'm finding that this is the my strength and I'm not a great Toastmaster. I'm not, uh, you know, I can't organize a contest, but I sure can, I can get these people moved along. And um, it all, <laughs> I gave a really harsh assess, um, feedback to one guy that came on and said, oh, I've been a mess in Toastmaster all these years and I've actually never had a mentor. And I was just like appalled and I said that. And I did have to apologize later. It was a little bit of a harsh evaluation, but he did go and get a, a mentor and forgave me first. That's good. We like the forgiveness part. <laughs> oh, that was bad though. <laughs> There's better ways to do this. I'm learning. I'm learning. Yeah, you need a mentor mentor. <laughs> okay, Mark. Yeah, I, I confess I'm one of those guys with multiple DTMs. And I've never had a formal mentor. But I've had help from a lot of people. Experienced people in my club, experienced people outside of my club. But I wanted to share a mentoring experience where I was the mentor back a few years. We had our uh, club president elect got upset with the club and quit. <laughs> so I had to talk and I was a VPE at the time for that year. And I had to talk another member who was rather reluctant into uh, becoming club president. We had to have somebody in there. I could not, uh, I had been the previous year so I could not succeed myself. And this young lady uh, had been in Toastmasters two or three years, I guess. And she did extremely well, but she would not take it unless I agreed to mentor her. Now, this was back under the traditional, the so-called legacy program, traditional, you know, uh, CCCL, that one. And the only thing you could get mentoring credit for in those manuals was mentoring somebody on their speeches. So we pulled off, we pulled, we had uh, some issues with membership that year, we got things going. And the next year we're 10 for 10 presidential. And I was president that year, but it wasn't because of me. Uh, but Nancy did a marvelous job and it, it was a great experience and credit. I don't need no stinking credit. <laughs> the credit was the credit was getting somebody help. Okay. Um, now, one of the things you might be looking for in your clubs is people who want to raise their heads and say, "Well, let me let me try this this leadership thing," and of course that is a little bit scary but with uh, in the encouragement and 
the mentorship of people who have been in those offices, it allows them a chance to get their feet wet and follow around a new officer or, or a, follow around as a new officer, follow somebody that's already in the in that position. Or um, we had uh, assistant division directors and we had assistant area directors. And uh, one of our assistant area directors decided he was going to put out a um, newsletter. And it was spectacular every month. And I'm going, how is he doing this? I to, I'm going to put together a newsletter. No problem. Yeah. Retired. What's yeah. happening? I don't know. It's just, you know, we're having meetings next week. Um, people are showing up and giving speeches and, um, <laughs> and he would come out with a two page newsletter. It was, it was just a work of, work of art this was the same guy that thought he didn't need any help um evaluating on his speeches but so he was a lousy speaker and a great newsletter writer um <laughs> it, <laughs> that kind of thing but um when we're looking at mentoring there's different ways we can do it you can assign a mentor that's going to help people get comfortable with being in Toastmasters and following the path and figuring out how those things work. And you can have somebody that's going to mentor somebody that is um, what lost the spark, uh, may need some more inspiration to get back into what they joined Toastmasters in the first place instead of saying, okay, well, I got my DTM and I got my second DTM and I been an officer and I oh, why am I still in Toastmasters and then you apply this spark and they say I can hardly wait until the next meeting <laughs> and that's that's always something that helped you know um so uh Rebecca if if if, you, if I may that that was one of the themes of my speech I gave at uh why not speak last Thursday why am I still in why am I still in Toastmasters? Do I have a a deeper goal that's not checking boxes on a, on a spreadsheet or on a web page? Yeah, uh, it's practicing to get messages and communicate messages out to other communities. So I'm, that's going to be my focus for this year. It's practicing to do other things in other mm -hmm. arenas. So it, um, when we are working with uh, people who are just starting in Toastmasters or people who have been in for a while, take a look at the bigger picture. Okay. All right. So now how many of the members of your clubs have visited other clubs? Well, in River City Speakers, most everybody is a member of three or four other clubs. <laughs> so that, but um in fact, same thing for NMC and DTM and dynamic speakers and yeah, 229. <laughs> Wait a minute, 229 doesn't have as many people that are dual members, does it? Can you count them? Three. Okay, three, three of the members of 229 are not in more than one club. But uh, for a lot of people, showing up at another club is like, invasive but uh what kind of benefits can you get when one of your members who is not a coach and not an officer shows up at another club and then comes back and reports to your club what kind of benefits can you have scott i'm going to be mean and pick on you <laughs> you are muted Repeat the question again. <laughs> what benefits can your club have when one of your members who is not a uh, an officer or a coach goes to another club and then reports back? Well, yeah, I the one benefit of going to 
any other club, when you've only been to one club, your own club, it's fun to see how other clubs do certain things differently. Like we don't have the ballot counting. The other club might have ballot counting and have a prize for best speaker, best evaluator, um, best table topics. Uh, they come back with new ideas, I think, regardless of whether they're involved or not. But um, usually the officers will come back with things they want to change their club with. If they're not in an officer or an active leadership role in your club, um, but hopefully they come back with some new ideas for their own speaking ability or their own communication. Um, it all depends on what you're, you know, you're looking for. But I know anytime I attend any training or go to another club or I always try to bring something new back and then apply it to my club. That's good. That's good. Um, so what are the biggest challenges that are standing between your members and their goals? Mark. Now she's having to think. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the challenges between what the members are and what their goals are. That's the question. Just want to make sure. Yeah. Um, well, some of them are just straight speaking opportunities. If, if your club's very active and there's not a lot of uh, speaking opportunities, which is definitely not a problem with any of the clubs I belong to. But a lot of them, some of the speakers who only speak once or twice a year, they either are lazy and like, they just wanna speak. They don't wanna bother going through the pathways and figuring out what the actual speeches are. Like I have one who's, who's a, a clergy and he has, he wants to just practice his, his sermon or, or some motivational thing he's talking about. So he just wants to practice that, but he doesn't wanna bother going through, finding out what path that could possibly fit in or what level. So lots of times I'll just meet with him and I say, well, this is what you're going to speak about. Let's fit it to here or let's fit it to there. So, so that's one thing that I found uh, going through. Uh, another speaker that I'm really having to coach is he just, he says he's going to do the speech and he gets right up to three days before and then says, I can't do it. And that's happened four or five times now. I know right now he has COVID, so that's his excuse this month, but so lots of times we just meet with them and practice it. And, and when he does it, he does a great job. And we really pra we praise him on it. But it's just he gets so upset within himself that it just takes him time. And, but he's been a member for five years and very active in everything else, but only gives about two or three speeches a year. And we just got to keep encouraging him. So but how do you that's handle what with our members? How do you handle... Um, now you have, you've done the praise and everything for everything they've done and you've uh, stepped in and done the practice with him and everything. What is the basis for his fear? He has a speech impediment. He tends to stutter and with it, you just got to keep encouraging him, encouraging him on because he's, you don't even notice it uh, unless he tells you he has it. And we, you just got to keep, encouraging them on. I think that's mm -hmm. what we've been doing. Okay. Um, do you have uh, some programs that allow him to do shorter speeches? Uh, like, he hasn't yeah. finished his level one yet. So they're very short, but he does, he does table topics. He, he okay. loves doing table topics and he uh, t does timing all the time. He's very active, does all of our contest timing. Like he's very active in everything and he'll do grammaria and he'll do any one of the roles. It's the actual speech mm -hmm. that, and he'll do evaluations. It's just that speech that gets, he, he just has nerves that it happens. So it's kind of a performance anxiety then. I think so, yeah. So we had uh, one who, used to get up in front and tell everybody that he had a brain uh, injury. And so that was keeping him from speaking very well. And we said, don't tell us that. We don't want to know. Mm -hmm. uh, just, just speak. And he gave a speech on surviving in the wilderness and our jaws dropped because it was like 
how did you survive that? And then he said, but I did. <laughs> um, but I, it's, it's a very difficult thing. Uh, one of our, uh, well, he was a, a division leader and an area director, and uh, he had such a terrible stutter that when uh, when he gave his icebreaker, he had 64 ahs and ums in his icebreaker because he kept repeating himself, and then he had the ahs and the ums on top of it, and he was shaking to the point where the the lectern was moving and his knees were knocking and everything and you would never know that now um but okay so um now uh what do you consider uh the biggest challenges with your club the one that you're coaching or the one that you're in and its goals now most of us are going to say membership but half of the stuff that we could solve with membership has to do with how well does the club manage its goals. So, Amy. We were just talking about this this morning, and I think the reason, um, the biggest challenge is how to reach the members. We know, we know who, we have an idea of what kinds of people we'd like to have as members. Our problem is finding channels and methods of reaching out to them. And we've, we've had some pretty good brainstorming sessions around that, though. So. Yes. OK. Um, Reminder, have you had any brainstorming sessions with your leaders? Yes, uh, we, we are having it. and. Uh, what challenge we are facing is the problem of uh, nowadays, I mean, like uh, they are not able to attend the meeting and uh, uh, achieving their target. But overall, we uh, we went through the success plan and uh, on the table of DCP, we are already six uh, DCP points. And uh, overall, what uh, challenge we are facing is that um, like new people are very uh, active and uh, participating, but the O oh, I mean like uh, veteran are little bit back. So as you mentioned that mentoring uh, we required, but they are adamant to adapt that also. But uh, somehow with the uh, intervention of our VP education and myself as a IPP. So we are talking to them regularly and we are not asking, okay, do this speech and all this. We are just asking, okay, one time come and uh, enlighten our meeting. So instead of giving them some task, we are just asking them, okay, uh, uh, come come to the meeting and just uh, uh, give your, um, your feedback to the new members and all this. So that way we are also getting successful and getting the old member to be another um, into the meeting. So that's what uh, strategies we are adopting with the, um, our uh, XCOM members. So it that's, is working. That's a very good point. You notice how he said that uh, we're not telling them what to do. We're remembering that the club is not broken. The members are not broken. They all have the answers within them and they know what to do. We don't have to tell them anything. We just have to ask the right questions. We just yeah. have to ask the right questions. So Barry, um, have you had a brainstorming session with your area or division directors on how to uh, save, well, not save, but uh, to uh, enhance these low member clubs? I have. They all think it's a matter of publicity and getting the word out, but aren't sure where. And I, I walked them through the exercise of, if you want young people, TikTok. If you want people our age, maybe Facebook or email or a newsletter of some sort. But the how you publicize it depends on 
what did you call it? The avatar, I guess, who, mm-hmm. who you're targeting. It matters if it's, you know, a group of college kids and you do it on Facebook, you're probably not going to get any results. Right. Because the college kids aren't on there. Um, and, and that seemed to be a really hard message for my area directors to, to understand. They're like, but it's, it's, it's the geography. It's all of the geography. We should publicize it in the library. It's maybe the grocery store, but not everyone goes into the library. <laughs> Which is sad when you think about it. Yes, I know. Yeah. Uh, we used to actually have meetings in libraries. And then, of course, COVID stopped stop that from happening and we had competitions in libraries and museums and churches and can't do that anymore <laughs> so um vicky have you ever tried to schedule a contest practice so that people not not just the, not the speeches but finding out who does what in a contest No, <laughs> I've yeah. We we normally what we I've done in the past is if it's in an area or a division contest, would go to the clubs and just ask, you know, who would like to fill these roles or look at the role and say, oh yeah, they do a great job. We'll we'll ask them, and then they end up at every area contest and every division contest, and you get seeing the same people. So I I think that what you're suggesting is is a great idea in asking people what they would like to do and to train them for that role. I think that's a fantastic idea because it lets people go out of their comfort zone and show other members that what they are, what, that these people will step up and they are prepared to go out of their comfort zone. I Mm -hmm. think it's a terrific idea. Exactly. Yeah. So this is another way that you might uh, use um contest as an inspiration for uh people who have been in the uh, in uh toastmasters for any length of time and they will go to contests but they won't participate and then there are those that participate in everything now, i think i recall there was one contest we went to where uh little less than half of the judges had to recuse themselves because they were in the same club with one of the contestants and we were walking around saying hey you want to be a judge you want to be a judge (laughs) that's not the way to do it (laughs) but um so uh well mark you were the one that had to deal with that i as i recall yeah that was a the first uh area contest that I helped organize. We, we paired two areas together where actually the venue was at Scott's meeting place. And there, there was a question about how the uh, rule book should be interpreted. But we ended up at that time, you probably weren't supposed to have judges who are in clubs with contestants. It's changed a little bit since then. And I got there and, and people, contestants were okay. Judges kept recusing themselves. I won't tell you how many judges we ended up with, but we decided we would have the contest. We had uh, some really, some people with super integrity to do the judging. Uh, we did not have the specified number of judges but when it hits on the contest night you get a choice you can cancel the contest and try to reschedule it or you can do it and we just did it that was a very scary time but yeah it it turned out all right going going to the uh question that becky in terms of uh practicing or or meeting ahead of time we got to one uh, contest uh i think it was a division contest that same year and the uh, toastmaster or organizer assumed the uh, chief judge was going to find the judges and the chief understood that the 
organizer was going to find the judges. And we got there with no judges. And it, it got to be the same thing. Now, we were fortunate enough, there were enough people that came to the contest that did not have the conflict with the uh, contestants, that we were able to have a full, full slate of judges. Um, but again, both of those are situations where you really want to get people together and informed before the night of the contest. The, the briefings at the contest, those are great. But uh, one of the things I learned after that is I never chose, never looked for judges until I knew who the contestants were. And knowing who the contestants were, I went out to uh, International, downloaded the, the uh, rosters that were available for whatever level I was at. And I looked them up and listed the clubs they were in. <laughs> it's not who they were representing. But, you know, I'm not eligible to compete this year. If I was, I would knock out judges from six different clubs because I'm a member of six clubs. Oh. I oh. sometimes think that's too many, but one of the benefits of the COVID lockdown, I've got more disposable income. <laughs> well, okay. So now when you are uh, doing a things like uh, planning a contest and you train them in these different math matters, then when you have a situation like that, there would be somebody in the group that knew what was needed to be done and would get it done. But when nobody is trained, can they get credit for, for this type of training? You betcha, you get one of those uh experienced people in your group and you say can you tell us how judging works in a contest and then have them give a speech on that and then you have somebody say can you tell us what the sergeant at arms does in in a uh table topics or uh contest or an evaluation contest and have them go through you know oh yeah you have to take the phones <laughs> and things like that. That way, when they've already been schooled in this, when they are asked, they don't turn you down because they, they don't know how. They turn you down because there's a scheduling conflict. You say, oh, I could never be a judge. And you say, oh, yes, you could. You got training. I was there. <laughs> so, yes, remember. Yeah, my question to the Mark is that since he is a member of six clubs, so how many meetings he is attending? It means as per the normal, every club has a two meeting. So how many meetings he is attending? I'm mute. Okay, two of the clubs are advanced and, and meet only once a month. And the others, one of them, one of them meets every week and the others will meet twice a month. And I don't always get to meetings. Uh, Tonight, I, I was at the meeting of one of the clubs, Rebecca mentioned at 229, which is the oldest club in our district. Um, so I was at that, I actually attended in person. So I had to drive back and got here a little later than I wanted to because I, it's my Zoom account. <laughs> I had to get the meeting started. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so you're I'm looking at, uh, what probably call it 12 meetings a month, potentially. Um, and the neat thing about one, you know, you, you, you have to find positive things. A positive thing about the COVID lockdown is that I can get to meetings very easily. I've got a me, I've got a club, Amy happens to be in it. In fact, I'm in two clubs with her. Uh, one of them meets Monday mornings twice a month. I have no problems getting to that meeting because it's across the across my office from me is where I work. <laughs> <laughs> so I just I just have to shift my work day a little bit. And the other one is at noon two sat two Fridays a month, and it's the same thing. I just shift I just split my work day into two four hours portions, and it's easy to do. 
if we weren't doing Zoom, both of those would take two to two and a half hours out of my day because they would both be meeting up in Omaha. Um, and that's, you know, that's a, that's a neat thing with, with us going to, to the ability to do hybrid meetings. Um, And I, I know we have uh, one member of. Uh, she's in a member. She's in a club with Amy, who I think visited clubs in all fifty states last year, plus several. Yeah. Plus foreign, a whole bunch of countries. countries. Yeah. Foreign desk countries. <laughs> we made a she made a challenge of it. It was cool. Yeah. We had a we had a visitor from I think she was from Chicago for one meeting. She was starting her second time through the paths. She was averaging a, a meeting a day, and she was just looking for places to go. She was retired and loved the organization, but she saw it as a challenge to get out there and meet people. And you just. It was impractical before. Yep. Oh. Thanks, Scott. Okay, so has anybody run into some problems that we haven't discussed tonight having to do with goals? This is funny. Toastmaster's not talking. I thought maybe I'd talked enough. <laughs> <laughs> when I when I joined, I joined in two thousand nine. Uh, I joined a fairly fairly experienced club, and Rebecca was already a member, and we had a two pass district governors, past international director in a club of about 15 members. And my first goal that I actually set for Toastmasters was to complete a CC in a year. And it took me 13 months. But the, then as I started getting more involved and actually visited some other clubs and got involved with uh, going to the officer training that Rebecca was speaking about earlier, I started setting new goals. And uh, right now I'm kind of lost a little bit because I'm not sure what my next goal should be. <laughs> it means you need a mentor, huh? <laughs> All right, I didn't hear that. Yeah, you need a mentor. Probably, I, I've got a prodder and I've got a uh, helper, <laughs> and a few, you know, a few other people. You, they, they don't, you don't have to have uh, formal mentors unless you really need one. But, uh, you join that, uh, you know, Odyssey project is going on. You can join Odyssey mentor mentee program. That is very helpful. <laughs> I have a feeling that uh, your meetings might be at a strange time for us up here. <laughs> well, oh, okay. Um, think about this this week when you, you uh, work with your clubs between now and our next meeting. Uh, take a look at your the goals that you'd set as a club and as a, a member and compare them to where you are now, how far along you are on, on your path. Ha ha ha, notice how I worked that in there. And how uh, your club is progressing. And then think about those events that you could have that bring people in 
and make them want to stay say oh well this is a great group of people i want to be here they will make decisions emotionally and defend them logically remember that so you have to uh when you are uh, looking for your club avatar find out what their buttons are and stand on them you know are you tired of being the new kid on the block how about if you talk like an old person we can teach you how to talk like an old person you know <laughs> or um are you worried about your um oh your your skills when it comes to briefing people so uh we live close to uh air force base and so they have to brief the colonels and the majors and all of that on what's going on and they have to be able to do that briefly and if it goes on too long then the general starts leaning forward and giving this nasty look and then getting up out of his chair so now i do you want to get the stare from the general or you want to get the open mouth from them so what we're trying to do is we're trying to put that picture of what they want nice and clear saying we know how to do that we can show you how so oh you want to do well in your interview picture yourself sitting in the in the chair in your suit with your briefcase with one piece of paper in it and getting the job because you are so well spoken and so cool under pressure wouldn't that be fun? We can show you how, <laughs> you know, so uh, you get them with the questions, you put them in the place where they are now nervous and unconfident. And we solve that problem for them and they will come to take a look. And if they like what they see, they will stick around and if we have our goals set and there seems to be um, a purpose for the meeting not just to get together and listen to somebody talk and they can see that progress is getting made in this club they will keep coming back and all we have to do is remember to ask them hey you want an application so if there is nothing else uh, i think we will call it a night i enjoyed seeing you guys again i i was going through uh coach's withdrawal for you know, <laughs> the, but um enjoy your week take a look at your club goal take a look at your own goals and uh see what you can find out We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Yep. Thanks. Thanks Thank for you. hosting. See you next Thank time. Thank you, Rebecca. They learned a lot. Every time. That's good. That's yeah. good. Thank, Thank you, you, Rebecca. You. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank see you. you in a couple of weeks. Bye. 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 See you. See you. Bye.